Okay, so welcome to my talk. Uh, my name is Angel Bertini. I'm the author, I'm doing reverse engineering visual documentation, and the title of this talk comes from my uh, uh, work in uh, uh, the POC GTFO publication as the file for funky file format polyglot. So that's where the title of the talk comes from. Okay, so uh, this talk is about files, and what are the usual file categories? Uh, it depends if you're a newbie, a user, a dev, or a hacker. But in general, we, you, typically people are just interested in uh, uh, exploiting, explo exploiting uh, with file formats, and typically valid files are considered boring. Uh, but um, I still think the, 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 the important point is that the limit between... Can, can you see the top colors? No? There's valid written here. The colors are weird, no? It's supposed to be red here. Okay, weird colors. Uh, so um, the, the the problem is that the frontier between uh, valid files and corrupted is not clearly defined, and I play with it. So just let's take an example. And here is a valid file. So to just to show the kind of valid files that I like to try, it's not exploiting everything, but it's maybe not a standard file. So this is a JPEG picture that might ring a bell, and if you Oh yeah, it's also a Java file, because why not? <laughs> that, that's not really complex. But you can play further. If you apply AES on this picture, it's a JPEG picture, then you get a PNG picture. So it was encryption with AES. If you decrypt it with triple DES, then you get a PDF. <laughs> if you encrypt the same file, the same file once again, but with a different key, with AES again, you get a flash video. <laughs> I could go on and on and on, uh, getting crazy with a proof of concept. I thought I could do a whole talk on the, with a single file, but maybe that won't be a real talk. So at least I hope that by now you're convinced that I'm just a normal guy, and I just like to play with binary. Also, I like to explain and represent binaries, and maybe you've seen me, my posters uh, in the building. So this is a picture of them at the top floor. So it's printed, thanks to Kurt. And uh, so I also I play with binary, and I also like to, to represent <laughs> posters visually for everybody. And oh yeah, all these posters are free to download at pix.corecomic.com. And if you want to get a, to order a print uh, on a pillow, iPhone case, or whatever, it's print.corecomic.com. Okay, so, oops, no, it doesn't work anymore. What's wrong? Yeah, so uh, let's not go too deep into the, the technical details and let's go a bit back to the fundamentals and let's, let's talk about cows. So, how do you identify a cow? How would be the possible ways to identify a cow? And of course, we can apply the same model to file somehow. Is it by head? Is it by the, bo the body shape? Is it by the sound? Well, you can see that identifying a file could be done by different way, way the same way, the, in a similar way. In practice, here is an early file type identifier from French technology. So basically, you look at the head. <laughs> I had fun drawing a guillotine myself. <laughs> and so basically, uh, typically the file type is identified by a signature called magic that is fixed and enforced at offset zeros. Some have a meaning, some don't have. M most file formats have a magic signature at offset zero. Some don't, like the some archive formats, uh, uh, particularly the zip, which is also used in many other formats, like APK, JAR, and, and others. Some compressors actually enforce signature at offset zero. And PDF, which I like to abuse, Theoretically, it has to start at offset zero, but in practice, only within the first, uh, uh, first K of the file. So that's how I could abuse it. We'll see that later. We, I could abuse PDF files a lot. Uh, an important point for zip is that 
Zip doesn't enforce, it's not that Zip enforces a signature anywhere, it's actually Zips are written backward from the from the end, this is for uh, old, old school reasons, when you are writing a zip file on the fly on multiple floppies, it will write the last information on the last disk and it would minimize the floppy swaps. So basically, zip actually enforces that the start of the signature, I mean the, st the start, the first uh, structure to be checked is near the end of the file. Uh, the thing is, uh, it's actually not respected all the time, and I did a talk on uh, zip schizophrenia. If you want more details, you can check it later. Uh, a few hardware, a few formats are where bound to hardware, and us uh, usually when you have a memory range to be executed by a, C a special chip, then they don't care, they don't want a header there. So basically, tar, ISO, MBR, even TGA, they start directly with the data, and optionally they have a header that is later in the memory space. So those hardware, those formats have an excuse because they are bound to some hardware not to have a magic at offset zero. So, but in general, a good magic signature should be enforced at the offset zero and unique. And if you create a new file format, please respect this rule because otherwise it can lead to a few abuse that we'll see now. So if you think how a standard tool, a standard parsing tool uh, act, it just checks the magic, then it chooses a path, and it will never return and try something else. It found the signature, oh, I chose this path, it must be this file type, and it will ignore any other file type that could be included in the same file. So another common yet important property that is useful for abuses, you see a cow. There is something coming next, but you definitely see a cow. So it's like, so because you can see a complete cow, then there is a cow, then something coming next. It's still a cow, it's still a valid cow, right? It means whatever you put after, it was original. You see the full cow, so you think it's a cow and something else. And uh, file formats typically define a terminator that says this is the end of my file format. And once the terminator is, you made the terminator, there's nothing left to parse. So with this abuse of file formats not under forced at offset zero and some f uh, files format uh, allowing something that comes next, then you can just tag them up like the uh, uh, animals of Bremen, and you can end up doing a file that has several file types. So this is an example of a Jar Jar Bing polyglot. <laughs> so a Bing is a special game-oriented video format, and I chose a random picture to display by the video. So uh, you just get, create your Bing, and then you uh, append jars file, which are just zip, and as we saw, zip doesn't enforce be starting at offset zero. So that's why uh, Jar Jar being polyglot is possible. Now another kind of uh, file polyglots is when you have a host and a parasite. So if your frog, if your cow swallows, keeps a frog in its mouth, then it can speak froggish and cowish. So <laughs> the outer leaves space for the inner. Okay, a more realistic example. Here is our code with the various data chunks, and if your cow swallows a micro SD, then it's still a valid cow, even if it contains foreign data that is tolerated by the <laughs> stomach. So, as an example, I did this file, which was, uh, so it was HTML, Java, P Windows executable, and a PDF in the same file. So it's interesting because you actually HTML dropping, a, launching a Java, dropping a P or a PDF, exploiting and dropping a P are two valid infection chains and those two infection chains are present in the same file. And I, because I built entirely the file myself, here you have that the PDF part of the document is actually inside the Java. So it's not just stacking stuff together, but you put some uh, one format inside the other. You have some real life example in the wild. Oh, sorry, another example uh, with a, that's actually used for pen testing. Basically, it's a valid picture. Here you see the black line, that which is the picture, and it's also a valid JavaScript. You abuse the header so that it starts a JavaScript comment, and you close the comment, and then you put your JavaScript, so it's a valid JavaScript and picture. You can break a lot of stuff with that. Uh, it's also available in BMP flavor for your pen testing purposes. So, as I said, this kind of uh, host parasite exploitation uh, tricks already exist in the wild. It was represented in some famous movies. And it's just that the inner part used some unallocated space left or made possible inside the outer uh, file format. 
So, as I said, I worked on the POC GTFO. If you're not familiar with this uh, very nice publication, it's really interesting to read, but also the file itself. So the issue two was bootable, booting a Berliner Spargel OS. It's also a zip and a valid PDF. The issue three, I got a bit crazy. It was a valid um, radio message and a JPEG. And if you encrypt it, you get a PNG and a zip. Issue four was a valid TrueCrypt container, a PDF and a zip. And I just created this, and two days after, TrueCrypt is, uh, is discontinued. <laughs> Um, issue five was ISO, PDF, and a flash. So that's the ISO booting, a Tetris game, which was explained in the article, and you have the flash, which was recrawling the audience. And issue six is the latest issue that was out last month, is also a TAR, a PDF, and a zip. And this is one of the examples. If you open with a lot of PDF readers, they just see, oh, it starts with a TAR, and like the, the outrun picture, the reader says, it's a TAR, I open it as a TAR, and they never see the PDF. You imagine that with a security tool, and you, maybe you got to win or lose, depending on your side. So, oh yeah, a few interesting other polyglots. So Java, JavaScript, so it's two sources of JavaScript. You are using the source parser of the Java compiler. I mean, compiler, yeah. Uh, so that's, it's a Java and JavaScript in the same source file, or you can do the same at binary level, so that you can tell your friends that Java is equal to JavaScript, and yes. <laughs> Now it's proved. <laughs> okay, so not polyglots anymore, but still worth playing with because they always have funny results. Extre if you do extreme files, like way too small or way too big, they tend to bypass filter. So an analogy, that's actually a hoax. So the farmer got denied permit to build a horse shelter, so he just built a giant table to protect his horse, <laughs> and he doesn't need a permit. So that's actually a hoax. But you can feel it's almost real, right? And if you do it the other way, if you make a valid PDF files for Adobe Reader, so that's a complete file that is usually too small for software to consider it can be valid, then they just reject it and they will not parse it as a PDF. So you can bypass scanners and security uh, uh, feature, uh, protections by creating a file that is too small to be likely uncorrupted, valid. Or you can do the opposite, you can do a huge file. So here with a 64K of section in P, it, it, it was crashing directly all the debug and other tools because they just, if they were trying to allocate everything, even worse, the whole, every section was fully executed. Even though they are physically empty, they were taking a lot of, uh, the, all of them some space in memory, they were all executed. And it takes actually a few seconds on, on the modern computer to run, even though it does nothing but a lot of nothing. <laughs> So you crash not only, not only it's slow to execute uh, directly, natively, but also you crash a lot of analysis tools with similar files. So now we saw the, how to combine file types, but we can also abuse the parsing. How do you parse a cow? This is how a user sees a cow. So how do people parse cows? Well, you all know, you all know, have an image of cows parsing. This is how a dev could see, parse a cow, but it turns out that not everybody agrees, and this is how another dev sees a cow. So this is French beef cuts of a cow, the official beef cuts of a cow, and these are the Brazilian ones. So you see, it's the same data and different parser, different interpretation for different implementation of cow parsing. It would have been too easy, like uh, mankind really not just sucks with computers, but also with cow parsing. <laughs> so as you see, uh, the same cow can be seen in completely different ways. I mean, also, okay, the head is still the head, luckily, but still the parts are different because the standards are different. So if you abuse that, you can, for example, create a PDF that has three different trailers. The trailer is the defining the root element of a PDF. So this is the same file, and with three different viewers, it gives you the three random pictures. And because two uh, readers are not, so Chrome and uh, uh, um, new PDF uh, readers are not respecting the, the, the standard, 
like Adobe, then they see a different root document and they see a completely different document to be parsed. So basically, one file, but three different documents and the other uh, readers don't see the other uh, document, the two other two documents at all. It's not a trick in a conditional if by detecting the reader version or anything. Uh, or another one, a bit different here, but it's actually abusing a feature. But you have the PDF that shows something, and when it's time to print, it shows something completely different. <laughs> And, and here, it's not lack of uh, respecting the standard. It's actually a part of the standard, but unknown to most people because the yeah, it's uh, security by oh no, obfuscation by of uh, what is it? Not security by obscurity, but yeah, basically the standard is too complex with a lot of unused, not so useful for everybody, or not security oriented features, I'd say. Or uh, this is a presentation I did la, when was that, last year. Uh, so this was my presentation. It was my first binary inception. So that was the same file was the PDF viewer and the PDF slide. So basically, the, the file was viewing itself. And at the time, the people were watching the slides, but they were actually already watching the demo because it was the file running on itself. <laughs> and it was also a Java file and a JavaScript with Mario. OK, because why not? <laughs> And the same file, if you run it into different viewers, you have, it was also schizophrenic, so you would have a different document when open with a different viewer. So, a bit combining everything in one proof of concept, and this time it was not written by hand, it was like really generated, and that's now what we do for POC GTF4. It's, it's, it's a make file that combines everything, it's not me crafting manually. Uh, the file until the end, and also we care about compatibility. That's the problem. <laughs> okay, so the pro another problem that for security in general is that uh, you have unexpected parsers, and that's not mine, but that's uh, Elka. I don't know how to say Elka Tuff, who uh, basically found the uh, exploitation via the strings command. So that's a CVE, and basically you would expect that strings, the uh, command line co tool, <laughs> yeah. Uh, is uh, doesn't parse anything but just looks for string, but no, it's actually calling parsers and it's actually it was exploitable and it's a CV and, and now he also did that with less. So the problem is that not only you have different parsers but also you have parsers in an expected place. So don't uh, run strings on unknown file. Don't run less on unknown file. Don't do anything basically <laughs> because you never know, especially if the file comes from me. Who opened my slides? Okay, uh, just a little parenthesis on metadata, but you know people like to attribute, oh, there's a Chinese uh, string here, oh, it must be China, or North Korea, yeah, why not? Uh, yeah, so cows and, metada and metadata, because you cannot see the head in uh, uh, easily, then you just brand the, ca the cattle with a branding, and the problem is these branding irons can also be faked or patched into another symbol, like you extend the, the, the sign on the cow to look like something else, and the conclusion is that attribution is hard. And the big, the big uh, important thing for us, who I don't really care about cows, but still we did a proof of concept of a real uh, branding iron, but we didn't have a cow to just check about uh, metadata modification live. But just for the POC GTFO sake, we did, uh, I asked Moonin to actually forge a branding iron just for the sake of the presentation. That's me. <laughs> I'm a normal guy. Okay, now let's change a bit from file types and let's move a bit to crypto stuff. And the important thing is that usually when you encrypt file, you think that the result is encrypted in the terms of it looks random. So the operation of encrypting a file is usually thought as being random, but it's wrong as you saw in the introduction. And the, the result of encryption can be valid. So I'll try to introduce that quickly without all the advanced details. I did another presentation on that before. So basically, let's take two fake, I mean, uh, yeah, fake file formats. And uh, so we have a data file format and we have a text file format. And the properties that are important is that data has an end terminator. And after, what comes after this end terminator is ignored. So that's data is tolerating appended data. And text 
also tolerates a comment, like we'll ju I'll just take the normal comments. So you can, as soon as the source format tolerates appended data and the target format tolerates, has a way to, to, do a, to have a host parasite polyglot data, then this is, you, can apply, you can apply that. So basically, if you encrypt with a yes, you get something random in general. You cannot control what you have in input and what you have in output. Because that's, yeah, encryption. AES is still not broken to my standard here, at least. But the thing is, AES is a block cipher. It just works with block. And if you work with a the file, then uh, it needs to work with the mode of preparation. Usually, what people think, know about this, is that if you use the bad ECB mode, then you can still see the penguin, and you know that this is bad encryption. So if you use a, a, a mode of encryption that just takes every block and uh, encrypt them uh, independently, then each identical block will get this, give the same results. So you can, it's not good encryption, basically. So one of the mode, the CBC mode, is actually uh, uh, using an extra parameter, the initialization vector, that you initially XOR with the first plain text block. So basically, this is a par an extra parameter and then after encryption by AES with a given key, then you get the first cipher block. The thing is this operation is you can do it backward, you can decrypt, and the XOR also you can decrypt. So basically if you define the first plain text block and the first cipher block, then you can, you can and the key is defined once for all, then you can craft initialization vector that will actually make this block encrypt into this block. So now we control we can control one block of output, and then the rest, we can don't control that anymore. OK, but at least now we can craft an, I, an initialization vector so that the first block is something that makes it valid, and we still have control of something. OK, now what about the random rest? What comes next? We don't control it anymore, because it's a result of AES. We don't control any parameters anymore. We cannot do, we cannot manipulate that. So basically, we'll just here we use the command uh, feature of the text format, of the target format, so that our initialization vector starts a comment. So this will be ignored. OK, now we have chosen an initialization vector so that this encrypt text start a comment. So the magic signature start a comment, and this is ignored. Now if we take this file and we actually close the comment, we up, just append data and the original data, then this file, this file is correct. And it's equivalent to the initial file we wanted to have as a result after encryption. Now, the thing is, if we actually just decrypt with the same initialization vector, we get back the initial blocks, because these blocks here were just depending on the first blocks, not on the next blocks. So we get, we st we get back the original data file, and we have something random that we don't control, but it's after the end term terminator. So this is ignored, and this is still a valid data file as we wanted, and this is the text file which has the content that we want. It's not exactly the original file, but from a parsing perspective, it's exactly the same file. It's just using a comment and something garbage. So that's basically the trick of what was called encryption, and that's what I used in different ways with PDF flash videos in the introduction. So now, because AES CBC only works on what comes from the previous block, then this will indeed encrypt correctly as what we wanted. So now we have, we can encrypt this file with AES into this file because we control the initialization vector. But it's perfectly normal AES and AES CBC is seen as secure. So it's not a problem. Uh, it's not that AES is broken. It's not that CBC is bad like ECB. It's just standard, normal. It's a part of the specs all along because the file format tolerates extra data and appended data. So that's the layout of the files before and after encryption, another view. Uh, and you can even try it at home with just OpenSSL, for example, if you want to entertain your kids or your friends. You don't need much. And you should try. It's very good. Go to bed. No, OK. Uh, yeah. I'll let you try. OK, another kind of polyglot that is a bit artistic, but it's Interesting, because sometimes um, uh, advanced file parsers just look for the body, because they saw, they saw a head, they saw a JPEG header, and they saw, oh, here is my JPEG data, now let's skip forward. And this is 
a, J, a JPEG, a zip, and a PDF. And the PDF shows the image. The, Im, the JPEG is the image, and the zip contains the image, but the image is present only once. So basically, you put three headers, and you make them point to the same data. So if, by any chance, an advanced tool was just checking the bodies, then it will just see one file type, and it will ignore the others. So this is a layout, I'm not sure it's really visible now, but basically you have the layout of the file and JPEG, PDF, and zip. So JPEG starts first because it enforces the magic at zero, then PDF and zip, and the image data is only seen once. You still need to abuse the formats a bit. So for example, you have a part of the PDF structure into the zip commands because yeah, it was not made to, to be done so initially. Tough problems. So, okay, a different one. This is a picture of CAT, or a proof of concept, and it's a BMP that is not compressed. A BMP has a funny uh, characteristic that enables to define the bit mask of each color. And if you map it to a 32 bits, then you can have bits of free space. So you have for each, uh, so you have for each double word, you have six, 16 bits that you can control. What can you do with that? Well, you can put some sound so that you can play the picture. Seriously. And so now you can, uh, I won't make the demo because that would explode your ears. I mean, oh, well, I could, but you would not like me for that. But OK, you have sounds. So initially, we put some actual music into the BMP that was playable. It's not secondography because you can play it directly from a sound player. It's just raw PCM. But uh, we went better, we went further. So if you consider the BMP as raw PCM and you encode a picture in the sound so that it's viewable via SOX as a spectrogram, then you can have another picture in the picture when played by sound. <laughs> so never forget to... <laughs> so never forget to open your favorite picture in the sound player. And you have all the details here. And uh, um, Philip Tewen actually did further, and he did with three channels encoding each RGB picture. And he could represent that's the actual spectrogram view of the, day, the sound data that is integrated in this picture. So with represented with both lines. So this is image and this is sound. <laughs> okay, another kind of uh, artistic files. So this time it's you have two. The twice uh, two, two, two heads with the same type for the same body. And of course, it's not steganographic once again because the data doesn't need any extra extraction. It's usable directly. And, but it's, it's interesting. So this one, I do it live. So this is RGB picture. And does it work? Yes. Um, ooh, it's a bit small. Uh, so where is it? Yeah, this is this picture. So it's... Uh, it's a PNG picture, and this is an RGB picture. So let's show it again. So basically, the data is made of triplets of bytes and for red, green, and blue colors. OK? The trick with that picture is that uh, we, uh, wow, well, it's, does it work? Yes, that works. We added a palette, a random palette. And basically, the trick is that when you have uh, in a, when you have a picture data for a palette, then each byte is an index in the palette. So the idea is that you adjust each RGB value, red, green, blue, so that it actually maps to a different uh, color in the palette, so that it's a valid RGB, but it's also a valid picture. Yeah, I probably won't do it live. Uh, and so basically, you have a second picture that is stored in the same data via the palette. And in this case, this is the picture. And this is a barcode inception, because you have a QR code and a data matrix code inside. So depending on your reader, then you, you will see one or the other. The danger is also if you scan directly or if you just swipe, because if you swipe, it will see the smaller one first. So just, it's usually, you can see it, you can see the data matrix here. It works better with a white line, so you can notice it if you are trained. But if you didn't know, then maybe check twice. I mean, feel free to scan it. <laughs> uh, yeah, don't, you can trust me. 
No worries. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I also worked with uh, famous cryptographers, and they created a collision of a modified version of SHA-1. So this is the full SHA-1, all the rounds, but it's just that SHA-1 has five constants, internal constant, and you just modify four of them, so that it looks secure like SHA-1, but we actually can control something and get a collision. Okay, the collision rules are complex, and it gives you this. Okay, so you have these two blocks that collide, like, oh, really, really impressive. And the rules are a bit com complex. At most, three consecutive bytes without a difference, and every the word, only the middle two bytes have no differences. Okay. And this takes, like, uh, between 15 and uh, 30 hours to compute on 80 cores. So, whoa, this is a modified SHA-1 collision, but it's not exactly super impressive, right? Uh, so, okay, so my, my task was to abuse that in a valid, with a valid file format. And JPEG has the nice availability to have several, so it has a very short signature, and then it has uh, several markers, E0, E1, E2, E3, blah, 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 that we can, that are all valid, and then we just abuse the length so that we can combine two pictures, and then we, this, the, the uh, question marks, we don't control them. But at least, we, know, we can put something at the end. The other good thing is that the length is not too long. It's just on a word, not a double word. So you can, at the end of this length that was de de generated by the cluster, so we don't control, you can put back the start of the next image. The result is a bit more visual, two random pictures. So that's, they actually collide with the modified SHA-1. <laughs> And it, and it will just work with uh, m most JPEG size, I think, with any JPEG. And uh, that was just before the final, so yeah. <laughs> just a coincidence. Uh, and of course, because the problem is that the backdoor only gives you one collision block, not as many collision of you, uh, as you wish. It's also interesting to actually turn this collision into a multi-type, a polyglot collision, so that we could actually make not only a collision with value, various file types, but also with, uh, um, so we have the collision, but also with various file types, so that the backdooring is more efficient potentially. It doesn't mean SHA-1 is broken, but it was certainly an interesting experience from a file format perspective. Okay, this one is a real uh, demo. Uh, do you know the, probably the Pony Award? And Pony Awards has different categories, and one of the categories, the best song, which I'm not sure is poning a lot of things exactly. So, uh, Melissa won the Pony Award. That's, will it run you? Can you open? No? Can you, yes, can you open? No? Can you open? Yeah. So I made a PDF with a, her picture with the pony and the lyrics. Okay? Uh, but uh, Melissa, so a bad idea. Also can, yeah, well, I'm not sure if I should disclose. Can I see? Yeah. What happened? I, do I, I hope I have sound. Oops. Where are you? So this is a Nintendo music as a polyglot in the PDF. So you have the music, the lyrics. Oops, why did it stop? I don't know. Now you have a good proof of concept. You have the picture, the sound, the, the lyrics, and the sound. I don't know why it plays so fast. So obviously, never forget to open your PDF in your favorite console emulator. <laughs> Actually, I went further, and maybe you remember that, it's this picture, if you're old enough. I mean, I'm young, but yeah. And uh, in a similar way, I use, this is, as you can expect, once again, this is a PDF document, and the PDF document is a valid Super Nintendo and Mega Drive ROM. <laughs> with the offending logos up there. Okay, so uh, I still have plenty of time, do I? Yeah, what, well, no, I don't know, well, let's, well, yeah, I'll, I, do, do I do the bonus first? I mean, we, I still have a lot of time, right? Yeah, 
Oh yeah, so another one, I'll go back to this. Oh yeah, well, I'll do the conclusion. I can do the conclusion and the bonus again? Yeah, okay. So the conclusion, don't forget what you learned today. Open your PDFs in a hex editor, your pictures in a sound player, or a console emulator. Just apply any cipher in case, and double check what you printed. So a more serious uh, uh, advice for today, for security reasons, don't do anything. <laughs> and for research reasons, try everything. Uh, and especially if you say that you got something, stop uh, uh, the marketing and just uh, stop blaming people, oh, they got owned, because usually people blaming the other, oh, they got owned, are usually people who just want to sell their security solution. And yeah, POC, uh, prove, prove it or get the fuck out, because that's annoying to see all the people, oh, yeah, we hacked this, but we, yeah, we cannot prove it or anything. That's really annoying, I think. As you can see, I like uh, open, oh, say all the proof of concept of this uh, deck are public and everything, and they will be on my website. Uh, a bit more seriously, so for the file formats, there are many abuses of the specs in many ways, as you can see, but the specs itself are often wrong or misleading. The thing is, there is no one who steps in and says, okay, now we want to have like a secure zip, PDF secure, uh, zip secure, we just leave the people who originally created the spec, maybe update them and then we follow them blindly. And there is, we have, um, how do you say, a reaction of the InfoSec community when there is an exploitation, but because the spec suck, there is nothing like, say, okay, now let's enforce, uh, I don't know, something like zip secure, a new zi uh, or, a, or a PDF, something that would be more restricted to security and not uh, keep it in control of the company that is just marketing their professional product, but it's still not really secure, you know? A bit like um, public uh, reviewing, like, exactly like for crypto ciphers, uh, format specs don't have this, and it's the, the, the specs usually are really misleading, yeah. And uh, there are very few public parsers, and even fewer dissectors, like parsers that really understand what the file format is about, not just the structure and the double word and everything. And now it's, uh, humanity goes in the wrong way as usually, mankind. And for example, standard tools like uh, Office, uh, Adobe, PD, Adobe Reader, they, they, have a sec they have a secondary parsing mode where they say, oh, this file is detected, it looks like it's corrupted, maybe I could recover it. And they have a, you, you can see that they have a secondary mode that is even more lax than the official one. And just, it, it really puts back together, oh, now it's valid, okay, I'll execute it. And suddenly you have something that shouldn't be valid at all. This is just recovered, uh, thankfully. It's you, good for user, but for security, it's not. Or sometimes it's actually very uh, uh, annoying, like for example, WinRAR has a different parsing mode when it's viewing the file and when it's extracting. So yeah, what you see is not what you print, what you, what you list is not what you extract and everything. Yeah, very difficult. And if, once again, this was a kind of overall talk on the possibilities, but for the technical details, check my previous talks because I went into inscription with details, TrueCrypt and everything, or my articles in POC GTFO. Thanks a lot to everybody. And... I have some bonus, but maybe first. Uh, oh yeah, so that's later. So, do you have any questions? So, if you got any questions, please line up at the microphones. And uh, yeah, let's start with microphone two. Um, from your experience, do you think it is possible to write a file parser that will will properly decode something as seemingly easy as a GIF file, because Google a couple of years ago decided they couldn't do it and they decided, like for Gmail, when they want to display pictures, uh, images, they they wanted to sanitize the, the byte stream and finally they decided they couldn't do it, so they changed their model so it runs in a different security context. 
So do you think it's possible to write a parser that is clean, pr can produce a cleaned up version of a file? Uh, people, I, people are trying that. I'm not trying personally. I would first like the specs to be a bit more uh, uh, reasonable. <laughs> but no, I, I, I don't know about the formally possibility of this and everything. But it's, uh, I, what I see is that uh, when they say this buffer should be null, the parsers are never saying, oh, if there is any non-null byte here, let's return if I'm in secure mode and say, no, uh, it should be null, so let's be a bit uh, German and strict. And <laughs> but, <yeah. laughs> Thank you. Okay, then, microphone one, please. So what would your concise advice be for someone, say, designing a new binary file format? I mean, it seems to me it's start with a simple header, Make sure you check how you know that there's no garbage at the end, and then that's that. Well, first it depends if your file format is like made of pointers, like it's made to be executable, executed by an OS, or if it's like a structure, uh, a sequence of structure like uh, images. But uh, yeah, for those OS formats, you should. Um, it's difficult to enforce that because the loader evolves, and um, uh, mm, how do you? And yeah, you, you, then people have their own interpretation with the compiler. Uh, but at least I was thinking when enforcing the actual content, it's more with data file format. And yeah, OS, at least the thing is with the OS, usually you have one standard loader that no one knows fully. But it's like really defining the standard because it's not like everybody likes uh, to write his own elf loader for no reason. Sounds like we need a how-to. Thanks. Okay, microphone free. Uh, hi. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for the talk, and also thanks for your work in uh, POC or GTFO. Uh, I have one question. First of all, where can I download this presentation? And secondly, uh, how many programs should I try it with? <laughs> <laughs> I, I let you find out. <laughs> okay. Yeah, next one. there are a few extra spoilers in POC GTFO, but uh, I have my secret. <laughs> next one is microphone one. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, in the PDF spec there are basically two separate parsers, kind of, one for viewing and one for printing, uh, but that sounds like a really bad idea. Do you know why that is? Is it for historical reasons? Or? No, it's not actually the same. Uh, in this case, it's not kind of two parsers, it's just you... Um, you, uh, you it's for what you... The, the requirements of the screen or the requirements of the printer. So it's actually you enable or disable some content here. And it's not a discrepancy. It's, it's a part of the specs. Right. So the printing uh, schizophrenia is actually the only one that is uh, it's official. Yeah, it's uh, layers. And you make one layer appear on, by default for printing and the other for viewing. And it's because people are not used to enable or disable layers, then you can abuse that. But to be, uh, I accidentally found a few days ago with a manually edited PDF, a different schizophrenia from Chrome printing under Linux, where suddenly a parameter was ignored and you could have that. But I didn't have the time to experiment that further. And this time it was true schizophrenia, like what, you was, what was on the screen was different and it wasn't a feature. I mean, well, it's for a feature for me, but yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Microphone free. Yeah, thanks again for the talk. And I have a question. How did you find out about all the possibilities about the different parsers? How did you find out what you can exploit? Did you just uh, read the specs and see, okay, I can comment there and I can append there and it stays still valid and then I can combine these two formats or did you just it's, did it, exhaustive testing? So it's a part of my workflow when I'm doing a poster. I'm reading the specs a bit, but just enough so that I can create a file manually. But to be able to explain it in a clear way and, s and make it small, I need to be sure that I know what each byte, how, why each byte is there, just in case I could remove those bytes and make the file smaller so that it fits on the poster. And then in the end, I actually created most of this file manually. So I have good, um, I have total control of the files. That's why I could mix the Java and PDF all together because they are all written in assembly x86. But and, um, um, and then uh, I can easily experiment, say, hey, what happens if I change the pointer here, if I suddenly add a buffer and uh, the, I get a blue screen or different result or everything. So it's not um, uh, uh, differently exploitation research, but it's because I study, because I want to make sure what each byte is for, for the clarity, for the final result of the clarity of the poster, then consequently I can manipulate every structure of the file f uh, freely and uh, 
this happens sometimes, but many of those were dis discovered by accident, like open it in different viewer and you get a crash or something. Okay. But it's not active fuzzing, exploitation, and, 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 and I just read a part of the specs that I need to for my limited understanding. And I don't go through whole, the whole specs myself. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, then we've got a question from the internet. Yeah, this, this question is actually two questions or kind of a combined question. Um, somebody wants to know um, what are, or are there any like countermeasures and if they are and uh, how could you detect that somebody did like this advanced binary magic? What are the countermeasures and, sorry? And, and if you can detect if somebody did this stuff to a file. Well, you can still check if there is something at the, after the appended data. You can still uh, see uh, it's a problem that um, uh, you can uh, you could check if a buffer is big and it would not used. It's not referenced anywhere in the source. I'm thinking about uh, FX uh, Blitz Ableiter work on Flash, and as far as I so it was a sanitizer for Flash files. It was really rewriting the Flash files in a clean way, and as far as I know, n no one was really interested. So he, even though it was a work, fully working tool, so yeah, not not every, people just want to open the files anyway. It's, it's so this work should be done really at the specs level and not uh, as an extra tool. So there are countermeasures, but when they are well done, then people don't use them. Okay, microphone two. Hi, I would like to know whether you have ever tested how your files behave in a forensic environment like X-ways, NKs, FTK, or something like that. Uh, not really. I heard of funny results with the various security tools, but I'm not trying actively. And uh, uh, you, yeah, uh, I expect uh, surprises, especially because uh, if you see my previous talk on uh, that was uh, focused on file schizophrenia, where you have a zip file that was parsed in four different ways, different depending on the tools. But I don't try that actively. Lack of time. Okay, thanks. Uh, then we've got another question from the internet. Yeah, the question is, um, do you think we need to return to um, raw and plain text ASCII and uh, ASCII art for textual representation? No, but uh, no, absolutely not. But uh, it's just that uh, if you think about it, when you have a specs and it says this is reserved and should be zero, how many parsers are actually saying there's something wrong because it's not zero? Uh, Maybe I'm old-fashioned, but definitely, as soon as there is such a field, then I can write some whatever in there. And as, as long as I can allocate a buffer, I can put whatever in there. So, uh, no, not going back, but at least not being afraid to enforce a few things like you have for, uh, like, say, crypto algorithm, where people uh, have public reviews before things are going public, I think. Okay, are there any more questions? Uh, no, just a few of the bonus that I had. Okay. Uh, okay. Got 10 okay. So bonus stage. Uh, yeah, the the abstract of that on uh, the, the, that talk was initially ASCII only because an abstract needs to be ASCII only and a PDF tar polyglot with some ASCII art. So that's probably why people were afraid to actually check my abstract in the first place. But uh, <laughs> the far plan uh, re uh, removed all the new lines, so I went back to a standard. Uh, Abstract, but that was that's that's the file name of the tar archive of the tar yeah okay. Um, uh, Solar designer did a great keynote a few months ago, and this keynote was is the title was is infosec a game, and the keynote was a game that, that he for which he used an old engine and he used some very nice graphics with uh, that can ring a bell. Uh, including a dollar run. And so he, the whole uh, keynote was a game that he played through and he made all the interactions. You have, a, you, I don't know if you see the oh, go to, fail, peek, poke, exploit, patch. So it's really, but it's a bit difficult for people to just enjoy his game because they would have to run it into DOSBox and everything and go through the game without knowing really what to do. Not everybody has the time. So he created screenshots of all the game and uh, I just and I just wrote it by hand, the PDF that contains all the screenshots in the original resolution with bundled the actual game so that you can run the game from the PDF. Because why not? So that's a good way to distribute it as a single file with everything without any hurdle. Uh, yeah, just Quine. Quine, people you see artistic valid files as Quine. I don't do that much, but just in case. So Quine is just a file that prints its own source. So basically, this is a P file that prints its own source, but it, once again, 
I don't use linkers. I create the whole stru uh, header structure myself. Then you can do that. Yeah, you, coins are very sexy, so using a ch compiler chip to my standard or linker. So you have coin relays, and basically you have a elf that creates the source of a P and a P when you create the source of an elf. But I'm uh, really a little player here because there's a Japanese guy who did that with 50 languages. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, a few other encryption proof of concept, the initial one, so you encrypt this into this, and etc. So I had fun with random pictures once again. Uh, then you can also combine, so this is a polyglot with a hash collision and schizophrenic, because if you think about it, it's always possible, and it's more artistic. And that's about it for today. Thanks for your attention. Thank you.